It caught the attention of everyone in the newsroom today when the government reported a new case of mad cow disease, the first in this country in six years. And the immediate question was, of course, is the public in any danger? We asked Wyatt Andrews to look into it. This time, the disease was found in a dead five-year-old cow that was taken here, the Baker Commodities Rendering Plant in California. It was about to be ground into pet food when a random test discovered the illness. The USDA stressed there was never a danger to humans from the cow's meat or milk because no dead cow is ever slaughtered for human consumption. The USDA's chief veterinarian is John Clifford. This particular animal did not enter the food supply at any time. So there is no concern about that. Scientists we contacted agreed there was no risk to the public. The diagnosis was atypical BSE, or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is spontaneous and not known to be contagious to humans or animals. Atypical also means the cow did not get sick from other cows or from eating a banned type of animal feed composed of other animals. It is not likely to be attributable to uh, infected feed, which is the method in which uh, normally BSE would be spread from, anim from cow to cow. There have been three deaths in America from mad cow disease, a brain-wasting infection with no cure. But all three victims had spent many years eating beef overseas. No American is known to have died from consuming U.S. beef since the increased testing began nine years ago. Still, there are two concerns. Beef exporters are already worried that consumers in Asia will hear the words mad cow and slow down purchases of American beef. And even though the atypical form of the disease is not known to be a problem, Scott, no one knows what causes atypical mad cow or how many cases are going undetected. Wyatt, you just said in your story that the new testing standards went into effect nine years ago. How many cases have they found in cows in that period of time? Scott, there have been four total since 2003, and three of those were atypical, like the one found today. Only the very first cow found in Washington State in 2003 had the infectious form of the disease that could have posed a risk had it reached the food chain. No danger to the food supply, says the government. Wyatt, thanks very much. So I work on a variety of different biological problems and they all have one thing in common. They have to do with the problem of protein folding. And in order for those proteins to function, they have to fold up into these incredibly intricate, complicated shapes. This is hemoglobin here, the protein that's involved in carrying oxygen around in our blood. And this protein over here is green fluorescent protein. But um, you can imagine uh, that it's kind of complicated for these proteins to fold up into these shapes. But the problem becomes much, much greater inside the crazy environment of a living cell where the concentration of other proteins is about 300 milligrams per mil. It, the cell is very, very dynamic and proteins are moving around and colliding into each other all the time. So when you think about proteins going about their business inside of a living cell, it's not like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. It's uh, more like the characters in a Marx Brothers movie, where chaos is poised on the precipice of disaster. So that's what we folks in the protein folding field call going off pathway. And proteins are doing that all the time in living cells. They're trying to fold and they often get it right, they often don't. And disaster can ensue when they don't get it right. And in fact, it's the cause of a lot of uh, human diseases. The cause of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, more commonly known as mad cow disease, has not been definitively determined. A widely accepted theory is that BSE is caused by changes in the prion protein, PRP, found in highest concentrations in the plasma membrane of neurons. PRP can be converted to an infectious form via a rare conformational change. 
This process is believed to be mediated by an unknown protein, protein X. This infectious form has the ability to convert properly folded molecules of PRP. The improperly folded PRP aggregate and form beta amyloid plaques in the plasma membrane, eventually causing death. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in Kuru in humans, scraping in sheep, and bovine spongiform encephalopathy all share a common basic appearance under the microscope. There's a pronounced vacuolation in the gray matter, which at its most extreme causes the brain tissue to resemble a sponge. In the cerebral cortex at high magnification, the vacuolation may be seen within or adjacent to neuron cell bodies, or in the tissue between them, where it's found in distended axons or dendrites. The spaces aren't really empty. Electron microscopy reveals that they contain delicate strands of membranes. The spongiform change is not accompanied by an inflammatory response, but there is an intense proliferation of reactive astrocytes, these plump pink cells. Here they're shown in a section that has been stained for glial fibrillary acidic protein. The astrocyte cytoplasm and processes are stained dark brown. We don't know exactly how the spongy change develops, but years ago it drew attention to a possible link between the various spongiform encephalopathies. I remember back in the early 60s, there was this idea that there were these spongiform pathology that might form a unit. And one, an epidem young epidemiologist named Jake Brody, who was at this meeting, jokingly and, and very facetiously said, well, maybe it all started because some Scottish minister who came down as a missionary who'd eaten mutton and gotten scrapey came down to New Guinea and was eaten by the locals who then started the epidemic of Kuru. Now, he made this thinking he was being funny. The fact is, in retrospect now, most people think that Kuru probably did start as a spontaneous case of Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease occurring in a, an isolated tribal group that practiced endocannibalism. These didn't go out and kill missionaries. These were people who ate their loved ones. This is to maintain, this to give them eternal life. And so it was a ritual of mourning and a ritual of homage to their relatives that they ate them, including the brains. So that appeared to be an epidemic that was started in just that way, as seeding into a particular situation. And that epidemic disappeared when the ritual was ended. But what was the transmissible agent that caused Kuru? And how did cases of other spongiform encephalopathies arise? The assumption was that a virus was involved, but no one could find it. I was a virologist before I went into neurology. And the idea that this non-inflammatory disease with an incubation period of four years might be an infectious agent just didn't make sense in my world as it was in those days. People were searching for the virus. People thought there was probably a virus there. But there had been no data that would convince a reasonable skeptic that there was a virus causing this transmissible disease, Scrapie, and then, of course, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease at the time I entered the picture. During a series of experiments over several years, Dr. Prusner and his colleagues developed techniques that revealed the infectious agent lacked a nucleic acid and couldn't be a virus. There was no evidence for a nucleic acid. It was all the evidence pointed toward a protein. It allowed us then to isolate that protein so we now could physically study the protein no one had ever known about this protein before, the prion protein, or PRP. Dr. Prusner coined the term prion to denote a protein infectious particle. Now we know that normal prion proteins are abundant in the body and are found in the membranes of many cells, including neurons. As with other proteins, they're produced in the endoplasmic reticulum, processed in the Golgi apparatus, and transported to the cell surface. And as with many other surface-bound proteins, they're engulfed by endocytosis and degraded within lysosomes. The normal cellular prion proteins are designated by the term PRPC. The three-dimensional structure of these proteins is predominantly made up of alpha helical configurations. In prion diseases, that configuration changes to become predominantly beta-pleated sheets. The abnormally folded prion molecule is designated PRPSC, because it was first identified in scrapie infected sheep. An abnormal prion molecule can induce other normal prion proteins to adopt the pathologic configuration, 
thus leading to a geometric increase in the number of abnormally folded prions. These molecules aggregate together. They're resistant to proteolytic digestion, and so they can accumulate within lysosomes or on the surfaces of the cells. They're also deposited in the extracellular space and can be stained with an immunostain using an antibody directed against the prion protein. In this section, the brown areas represent deposits of prion protein in a patient's brain. That protein, when it accumulates, is what causes the disease. The malfunction of the nervous system is really the result of PRPSC accumulation. One of the great paradoxes about these diseases, which is unique, is that they're sporadic, like sporadic CJD, they're transmissible, like iatrogenic CJD, and yet they're inherited as well. And that's always been a major problem to understand. And one of the attractions of the prion hypothesis is that it unifies all these different types of CJD by explaining it all due to instability in the protein. The discovery that prion diseases can be genetic, they can be infectious, and they can be sporadic is a whole new disease paradigm that no one understood before this was teased out. A spontaneous change in conformation sets off the process that leads to sporadic prion diseases, and those make up the vast majority of cases. In the familial forms, a mutation in the prion protein gene is responsible. The acquired or infectious forms are induced when abnormal prions from the outside gain access to the CNS. Those include iatrogenic CJD, Kuru, and variant CJD. Within the different forms of prion disease, there's also a range of clinical features, which may be explained by variations in prion protein structure. Prion diseases occur in many animals and in people. In animals, prion diseases occur in sheep and goats. We call that form of prion disease scrapie. It can also occur in cattle. We call that bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, or more commonly known as mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is not the same as CJD. They are both prion diseases in that both in mad cow disease and in CJD, the normal prion protein takes on an abnormal shape. And that's how these diseases are similar. But there are still very many differences between mad cow disease, which occurs only in cattle, and CJD. The only form of human prion disease that we know of that can be acquired from eating animals is a form called variant CJD. Evidence suggests that mad cow disease began when sheep that had prion disease or scrapie were unintentionally fed to cattle. That when the cattle ate the infected sheep, the scrapie, the cattle then developed a form of prion disease called BSE or mad cow disease. When people ate the ma mad cow, some people who were more susceptible to developing disease actually developed a disease called variant CJD. Variant CJD is exceedingly rare. There have only been about 200 cases ever in the entire world of s variant CJD. So variant CJD is the rarest of all human prion diseases and it is the only form of prion disease that is known to be caused by eating an animal.